All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the regular meeting of the City Planning Commission. Today is Monday, July 17th. My name is Alyssa Olson. I'm the president of the Planning Commission. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Emmerich will be absent this evening. Uh, Commissioner Alper. Present. Faxley. Here. Campbell. Here. Conley. Present. Ford. Here. Koski. Present. Marwa is absent. Meyer. Here. Chair Olson. Here. That's everyone, right? Okay. We've got eight members present. All right. We have a quorum. Um, I know there's a lot of you in the room. Um, what we're going to do is organize our agenda so we know which items are going to be on consent and discussion. And then once we have that and you know if your item is going to be discussed or not, if you would like to, there's a room across the hall that is broadcasting what you see on the screen here. So you can wait there until your item comes up and you'll have a seat um, and it'll probably just be more comfortable. Um, but we'll get, I'll let you know when we get to that point. Um, so next we'll uh, proceed to the agenda, a copy of which was poked posted for public access to the city's legislative information management system, which is available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. I believe there are also some uh, on the counter over there. We'll begin with acceptance of the minutes from June 26, 2023. Could I have a motion to accept those minutes? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes and the minutes are adopted. So our next role, or our next order of business is to organize the public hearing agenda. I'll read through the agenda numbers and addresses and state whether they're slated for consent, continuance, return, or discussion. Consent items will be passed without discussion by the board and will be adopting staff recommendation for those items. So if you agree with the staff recommendation, you don't need to do anything um, and the commission will pass it as recommended. If you have questions following that decision, um, you can check with the staff person assigned to the project. If you disagree with the staff recommendation, you can raise your hand and let me know and we will put that item on our discussion agenda. Um, everyone will be given two minutes to speak. There'll be a timer right here that'll count down so you know how much time you have left, but that way, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of you, so we want to respect everyone's time um, and make sure everyone gets an opportunity to speak. So with that, the following items are on the agenda for this evening. Item number four is 2730 through 2740. First Avenue South. This is the Simpson Housing Services Project, and this item is on our consent agenda and will not have a public hearing. Item number five, land sales, uh, Minneapolis Homes Financing Program. This item is also on our consent and will not have a public hearing. Item number six is 2648 Marshall Street Northeast. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number six? President Olson, yeah. we actually have a last minute continuance recommendation oh. for this item due to okay. the identification of an additional application. So there may be people here to speak because we did notice the public hearing, but the recommendation is a one cycle continuance to the July 31st meeting. Okay, so item number six on July 31st. There's it, okay. Okay, so yes, we will have an, uh, a public hearing for the items that are continued. If you came today and wanted to speak on those items, you can make your comments today um, for the future. All right, item number seven is 2626 Street East, and staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number seven? Okay, seeing none, we'll put item seven on consent. 
Item eight is 301 7th Avenue North, 615 3rd Street North, and 300 6th Avenue North. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number eight? All right, seeing none, we'll put item eight on consent. Item number nine is 2110 through 2114 23rd Avenue North. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item number nine? All right, seeing none, we'll put item nine on consent. Item 10 is 2432 Chicago Avenue. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation for item number 10? Okay, we'll put item 10 on our discussion agenda. President Olson, the staff report on that one is actually recommending a continuance as well to the July 31st. We're oh. returning that application and it will be on the agenda on July 31st. I wonder if my numbers are off. <laughs> okay. Um, so item number 10 will be returned. That's correct. It was withdrawn by the applicant. Okay. Well, okay. Um, item number 11, 1213 Franklin Avenue East. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone here to speak against staff recommendation on item 11? Okay, we'll put item 11 on our discussion agenda. Item 12, 3016 through 3024 Fremont Avenue South. This is the Fremont Avenue Apartments project. Uh, staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there one, anyone here to speak against? Okay, we'll put uh, item number 12 on our discussion. Item number 13 is 1901 49th Avenue North. This item will be continued to September 5th. Item number 14, amendment title 20, site plan review standards. We will discuss item number 14. And item number 15 is 1860 28th Street East, 2717 Longfellow Ave, and 1901 26th Street East, AKA the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility. This item will be continued to this September 18th meeting. And we already had a public hearing for this item um, on May 8th. All right. So to review, we have items four, five, seven, eight, and nine on consent. And we have items 11, 12, and 14 on discussion. Item number 10 will be returned. And we have items number six, 13, and 15 on our continuance agenda. Could I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. I see a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That motion passes and the agenda has been approved. Uh, next, we'll proceed to our consent agenda. Um, if there's anyone here on any of the discussion items who would like to um, go take a seat in the other room, you're welcome to now. Um, you'll be able to see and hear us there, um, but we'll do them in order. So it'll be 11, 12, and then 14. All right, um, so our consent agenda, we'll move on to that next. Um, first, we're gonna vote on the consent items on the agenda that do not have a public hearing. And after we do that, we'll open a public hearing for our um, public hearing con consent items. Uh, could I have a motion to adopt items Four and five on consent. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That motion passes. And next, we will open the public hearing for our consent items and the return item number 10. So if you are here and would like to speak on items seven, eight, nine, or 10. You can come to the podium now, um, state your name and neighborhood for the record and proceed with your comments. 
All right, I'm not seeing anyone, so I will close the public hearing for the consent agenda. Uh, could I have a motion uh, to adopt item seven, eight, nine, and return item 10? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes. Um, so if you were here for items four, five, seven, eight, nine, or 10, those items are complete. Have a nice evening. All right, um, we'll move on to our continuance agenda. So these are items six, 13, and 15. Um, item six will be continued to July 31st. Item 13 will be continued to September 5th, and item 15 will be continued to uh, se September 18th. Um, however, if you are here um, to speak on one of these items and would like to, you can come to the podium now. State your name and neighborhood for the record and proceed with your comments. Uh, President Olson, just a reminder that the public hearing on item 15 has been opened and closed already. Yeah. Um, so. It would be six and 13 for oh, the okay. public hearing yeah, today. Yeah, sorry, six or 13. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing any, so I'm gonna close the public hearing on the continuance agenda. Could I have a motion to um, adopt our continuance agenda? So moved. All right, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that motion passes. And we can move on to our discussion agenda. We will start with item number 11, 1213 Franklin Avenue East, and staff is Aaron Hanauer. So for the planned unit development to allow a six-story mixed-use building with 83 units, 43,000 square feet of clinic space at 1213 Franklin Avenue East, this project has 81, is proposed to have 81 enclosed parking spaces and 83 surface parking spaces. I highlighted the Hold on one site. second, Aaron. Would someone mind going in the hall and seeing if people, <laughs> I know it's a little hard to hear. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> job, uh, so the project site is along the Franklin Avenue Goods and Services Corridor, and current site conditions, you have a one-story building set back from Franklin Avenue along 21st Street here. Shown in the aerial. And again, uh, here, here's the development. Positives that staff sees for this project, more activity in the area, more people, more eyes on the street, and more family housing, three and four bedroom units, an updated plaza on the west side of the project site, enhanced pedestrian north-south connections from Franklin to 21st, and also, we appreciate the applicant ensuring that the clinic that's there now stays open until the new project is completed. So we appreciate that, and that's another complexity of the project. And then also a large, or 1,100 square foot outdoor area for, for children, kids on the third floor of the, of the building. So the, the development requires that condition use permit for the plan unit development, site plan review, preliminary, a preliminary plat, and that variance to exceed the pedestrian oriented overlay district standard to allow a surface parking, parking lot to be longer, wider than 40 linear feet. And that's the case along 21st Avenue. That, that's what the applicant is proposing. Um, so staff is recommending approval of all the applications, including that pedestrian oriented overlay district variance to exceed the parking width in a PO district. 
Staff sees that there's practical difficulties that exist with the project site that limit placement of where he could put parking. Um, that large through lot have frontage on Franklin Avenue and 21st Street, so both those streets. Also, encumbrances on the site. Um, we, you know, there is the existing plaza on the west side of the project site. The applicant is, that's an amenity for the area and, and the project. The applicant's looking to enhance that. There's a number of easements, cross access easements to the other parcels that also limit where parking could be placed. So for those reasons, staff is, um, sees that there are unique circumstances for the site that, that allow for supporting the variance. We also recognize that the applicant is using the project site in a reasonable manner that is keeping the spirit and intent of the ordinance. You know, we know that the purpose of the PO district is to preserve and encourage the pedestrian character of commercial areas and to promote street life and prohibit high impact auto oriented uses. Just note some of the things I highlighted in the report or have in the report. The applicant is reducing the surface parking from 99 spaces to 83, um, reducing that surface parking area to 78% of what it is today, add more pedestrian and people activity with the mixed use building, supporting the goods and services corridor by bringing the building to Franklin Avenue and adding landscaping, which isn't shown on this site plan um, along 21st Street. So uh, before I conclude, um, if, if I had some good conversation with people from the community and, and letters that came in, uh, just coordination with Public Works, uh, with preliminary development review, this is something that Public Works and CPED, our, our team do talk and we coordinate from the beginnings of a project to when it gets to you today. So we have, a, we have that PDR report. You got some of the comments that come in, in particular from Public Works, about access and safety, getting to the site. And we just rest assured that they have reviewed these plans and also they've likely reviewed this project in more detail because of a signal that's being redone at the corner of Franklin Avenue. So um, the applicant has comments that they need to address in the updated PDR report, but that would come after today's public hearing. So I just wanted to note that. Um, and I'm here to answer initial questions you may have. Thank you, Aaron. Um, commissioners, are there any questions for staff? All right, I'm not seeing any, thank you. I will now open the public hearing for this item. Um, is the applicant here and would they like to come up and speak? Yeah, please, you can come to the podium, um, state your name and neighborhood and proceed with your comments. Um, <clears throat> yeah. um, good afternoon, um, commissioner, um, commission members. My name is Dr. Anthony Staley. I'm the executive officer and president of the Native American Community Clinic, who is the applicant, um, one of the applicants for the project. Um, I just wanted to speak to you about the project and the significance of it and the importance of it, um, and just really briefly um, help you to understand um, <clears throat> the nature of the um, proposed project is to expand um, the footprint of the clinic, which is in critical need of um, of expansion and upgrade. Our current building is was built in 1982. Um, it is a building that is basically kind of crumbling down and falling down around us. Um, we've poured lots of money into renovating that, um, <clears throat> that property. We purchased the property a year ago, a year and a half ago, and, um, and as we started to design um, upgrades to that building and renovations to that building, it was really clear like we needed more space because we couldn't bring all of the programs that we currently operate in South Minneapolis under one roof, which is the point to having an integrated clinic model. And then we also, once we decided we were gonna build a new building, it became kind of a moral imperative to us as an organization that serves the Native American community in South Minneapolis um, specifically, but across the Twin Cities that given the fact that Native Americans represent about a third of the houseless population in the state, if not also the um, city of Minneapolis, that we had a moral imperative to do something about that. It also happens to be the primary um, specific, uh, the highest and the largest social determinant of health um, that contributes to poor health outcomes and poor disparities for Native people. And so it was kind of a slam dunk for us to think about building housing on top of the clinic. Um, 
the housing is a partnership, the clinic and housing campus is a partnership between Native American Community Clinic and Wellington Management Incorporated, who has a very long um, and stellar track record of developing uh, mixed use commercial housing and uh, spaces. And we will also partner with Avivo, um, which is a large uh, housing, supportive housing provider in the city of Minneapolis and in Hennepin County. And the goal is to provide stable housing to um, Native people um, that the clinic serves across the Twin Cities and also to be able to um, upgrade our clinic to provide um, expanded services. So we'll be going from about 18 or 10 exam rooms to 18 exam rooms, five dental chairs to 12. We'll be expanding a pediatric um, clinic footprint um, and in clinic pharmacy. Um, and also providing expanded diagnostic and laboratory um, services, as well as continuing to provide substance abuse treatment services on site. Um, we're hoping to break ground in a year. We're close to having our project fully funded, um, so we're on a good trajectory to get that accomplished and trying to do our best to serve the citizens of Minneapolis and specifically those of South Minneapolis. So. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any, any questions? Uh, questions for the applicant? Commissioner Conley. Thank you, and just um, um, really excited about this project specifically. The only question I have is will Maria still be there? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We are working hard to save Maria's because um, we love Maria's. Who doesn't love Maria's? Anyway, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on. Um, We'll be, again, like I said, we'll be limiting comments to two minutes. Um, it'll be on the timer. Um, and if you ever want to submit more comments than that, you can always submit comments uh, by email to councilcomments at minneapolismn.gov. Um, all right, so is there anyone here who would like to speak on this item? If so, you can come up to the podium, um, state your name and neighborhood for the record, and proceed with your comments. My name is Ray Peterson. I live across the street from the proposed development, um, and I'm uh, with Ventura Village. And the, um, I, myself and the neighborhood are opposing this project. We support the clinic expansion, but we have some questions about the housing, the density, and putting this many people on a site that's basically surrounded by a parking lot and busy streets, especially children. Um, but specifically, I think there are three findings that need to be made for a conditional use permit to be granted that we question if they're met. The one, the establishment, maintenance, and operation of the conditional use will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, comfort, general welfare. The second one, the conditional use will not be injurious to the use and enjoyment of the property in the vicinity. Uh, and the third one is adequate measures have been taken to ensure the safe and effective interface of public right-of-way. The main concerns here are that uh, there's an uh, entrance exit proposed onto East 21st Street. And in the past, that has not occurred, so we don't have the traffic from what has been the shopping center or that area going onto East 21st Street, which is mainly pedestrian and bicycle. Uh, it's very safe now. This would introduce a lot of new traffic that we're concerned about, and we, uh, we don't think there's enough information that's been made available to study that in order to say that these findings can be made. Um, the second uh, major one is that uh, we asked for a management plan so we knew how the housing would be managed, so we knew that it was being done correctly so it wouldn't be a negative impact on the residents, so we don't know how to evaluate and we think that we'd like to see that uh, before any findings are made that said it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? You can step up. <clears throat> this is my first committee meeting. <laughs> so my name is Mary Ellen Caluza, and I live near the project, just a half a block away. And I've um, owned my house for 44 years, have 50 years within a block of Franklin Avenue. Um, I am on 12th Avenue it, between 21st and 22nd. It is a one block long, one way street, very narrow. 
Uh, when I first moved there, if somebody drove down that street, I got up to see who was coming to visit me. Now it is constant traffic, and it's um, two-way traffic. Uh, um, we have, we're, we're so overburdened with traffic in that neighborhood that I'm really concerned about where that, you know, uh, routing all of that traffic to 21st Street. It's where I choose to ride my bike. Um, and, and like Ray said, you know, it's quiet, it's calm, it feels safe to ride a bike. But with all of that and there are school bus stops on 21st Street, it's a narrow street, semi still park on it, so it can be even more narrow. It's, um, <clears throat> I think the burden of traffic is just too great for the neighborhood and we already have such a great burden. Um, it, the 24th Street Mall, that traffic spreads for, for blocks. I see my time's running out. And I'm also concerned because I have the biggest lot on that block because back in the late 70s, the city wanted to get those two lots together and I turned one into a, um, a beautiful garden, but that means with my larger lot, I pay more for public or for street repair than anyone else, and I drive the least. And I'm picking up all the garbage too. Oh, no, okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Yep, you guys can just keep going. My name is Steve Dreyer, and uh, I'm a, a homeowner in that neighborhood, also uh, Ventura Village. And uh, I've lived there for uh, 40 years, and uh, 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 the, the, the many developments on Franklin Avenue that have uh, made it into a more positive place ha have always uh, faced and focused on Franklin Avenue. And, and, and this project, uh, with its uh, back on Franklin Avenue, I, I think is going to uh, create problems uh, with that. Uh, and, and, I, and uh, th that's my, my main objection, and, and also a uh, big objection is just uh, the density of a six-story building. Uh, I realize that the 2040 plan is changing the way Minneapolis looks and the way people approach those kind of projects, uh, but, but I think it's gonna be uh, uh, a mistake that you, you won't be able to correct. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patience Snellmach, and I've lived in Ventura Village for 21 years. Um, so I live a block and a half west of the proposed development, and um, I think you'll be hard-pressed to find anyone in the neighborhood that is against the expansion of the clinic. The clinic is a great resource. The, like, the video on their website says they're in the right spot for what they do. Um, but do have some concerns about the five stories on top of that um, of residential development. Um, so it's from looking at the land use application, my understanding is it's a half acre, um, and looking at the number of units, you're looking at anywhere, you know, 350 people living on a half acre. So, so lo again, looking at the plans, the main entrance exit, yeah, one off Franklin, but it looks like the main one from their parking lot is going to be onto 21st Street East. Now, I live off of 21st Street East, again, block and a half west, and... Um, there's no traffic enforcement anymore, and that's become a bit of a, a problem with people driving and driving unsafely on there. Same thing with uh, 10th Avenue South and 11th Avenue South. Um, and on June 6th, I was at a, there was a public meeting on traffic calming projects. And um, I went to that again June 6th and spoke with a city engineer that was working on traffic calming in that area. And that stretch of 21st Street East between Chicago and Bloomington was on, they had that highlighted along with 10th and I think 11th might have been as well, um, as being a problematic area for traffic safety issues uh, that they were planning on doing studies on. Um, so I don't know where that is at at this point, but looking at these plans, I don't know that that was taken into account that there is supposed to be a study on that stretch of, that, of the street at this point. Um, second item I just wanted to address is that, I don't know if you know, 
this exists, but there is the, the neighborhood has a master plan. And I know the city doesn't really take these into account anymore, but looking at this land use application summary, a little bit disappointing to see that the neighborhood master plan wasn't taken into account, the four-story cap on buildings, because the neighborhood master plan was put in place by people who live there. So a little disappointing that that wasn't taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, my name is Ben Marker. I uh, am patient's next door neighbor. Actually, we share a backyard. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for about 10 years now. And I, the traffic, I'm, I'm not as good with words as patience is, so I mostly just agree with her. But um, those are really cute pictures of the daytime of our neighborhood. Um, I work nights. I'm a bartender. And I'm coming home at 2 or 3 in the morning. There is no patrols any longer. Uh, the Minneapolis police is, what, 40%, if I'm not mistaken? And our neighborhood is dangerous. Uh, as a night walker, uh, I can attest to the fact that we're on our own. And this kind of increased traffic, uh, I'm a person in recovery, so I'm very sensitive to providing uh, recovery options for people. But this is a hotbed um, for, for drug dealing, drug usage, and uh, prostitution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Garbage, filth, blah, 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 blah. Um, I live and breathe on the West Bank, so uh, I like to get weird, man. But uh, it's a sketchy neighborhood, and uh, an increase in this kind of traffic is a lot of bodies and in a very hot spot. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Sam Olbexon, and I'm a resident of South Minneapolis. I'm also the board president for the Minneapolis American Indian Center, which is right down the street, and I'm the board uh, chair for the Native American Community Development Institute, which is right across the street, down the street. And, um, you know, we as, as a community have, uh, this has been the heart of our community for over 60 years. And so when we talk about who is the community, it's the community that, that I help uh, lead through these organizations. We have done extensive community engagement over the past uh, 10, 12, 15 years through the American Indian Community Blueprint, and plus the city of Minneapolis funded uh, a Great Streets Grant, which NACTI administered, where we showed uh, increased density, increased uh, development along the street steep. Uh, and our, our position is that more eyes on the street is the better. We're, we're providing more eyes on Franklin and on 21st in its development. The parking lots uh, facing the street are, are kind of what's killing the, the, the street life. The people are already there. We're not going to add more people. We're just going to give them houses. And so creating a safer zone, uh, thinking about crime prevention through envi environmental design, all these things have been considered in this uh, development. And so what we're doing is trying to provide not only something that's going to be an amenity to, to the city and the street, but also a part of a resurgence of all the development we're doing along Franklin Avenue as a community, as, a, as people who've talked and, and talked deeply, uh, the residents there, the people who live and work right on Franklin have all met and talked about this for years and the density is a good thing. Again, eyes on the street, uh, more public spaces, more access, and, uh, and we see this as a very positive development for Franklin Avenue and for the city and region. So thank you, miigwech. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Last chance, all right. Um, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, let's see, commissioners, is there any discussion? Oh, Commissioner Alper. Thank you. I would like to say thank you to everybody who came out to comment today from uh, Ventura Village. I, I think this is a neighborhood, this is, this is in my district, um, this is a neighborhood that has had many failed promises, and they, it experiences problems with no easy solutions. And I, I really believe that Dr. Stately and this clinic and this housing is a great step f forward. Um, it's an improvement on what's there currently. Uh, that said, I do have a, a few thoughts, um, and I, I asked, and I, I see this huge need, and I think we've talked about it as a commission before, that to have public work staff be more present at this public forum, because there's no other public forum where people can talk about issues around traffic and uh, around parking. And I looked at the PDR. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. But I don't see comments specifically talking about that. And um, 
I, I wish there were more strategies, um, just in general in our city, to as we as we build more housing for people, as we accommodate more in our city, we need to um, have other ways that they can get around. And so I uh, uh, would like, frankly, I mean, Route 2 along Franklin is increasing service in August. It's awesome. I'd love to see this, this development. I think I've mentioned it before, offer the residential transit pass to its residents. Is that something being considered? It's $14 per month per unit. OK. Not decided yet, being considered but not decided. Okay. I'm David Wellington, Prospect Park resident and developer with the Native American Community Clinic. To answer your question with regard to the transit passes, we're considering it. We've got a significant gap uh, on the funding side for the housing that. We're passing the hat right now with a bunch of different public sources of funding, so if there are ways for us to be able to fund that specific request, we would do it. Great, great, because I think, I think some of these strategies would appease, I hope would get at some of the concerns of the, the neighbors. Um, and I, I think there's some, I, I've heard a wind about um, certain grants that are in the works around residential transit pass, so I, it would be a great project for um, you to partner up with on that. Thank you. Um, I also just want to say I, I think there's a need for more parkland in this neighborhood, and I did note that this project will be paying into the parkland dedication fee. So I just want to say that that's great, and I'm aware of that. Thank you, Commissioner Conley. Um, thank you very much, and so thank you um, to everybody who came out and speak. I too represent this area. I am your District Four Commissioner on the Hennepin County Board, and I'm very familiar with this project. In fact, I grew up in the neighborhood, and so when you were talking about how you come up on 21st and it's a whole different world than when you cross over uh, and you're facing, you're on the Franklin side, it's different. It's it's very very different. Uh, it's fast paced. It's moving, and in fact, Franklin Avenue is under a redesign right now. Franklin Avenue is a county road. Road. And so there may be even more traffic in the future uh, pushed back into the residential area. And so I'm just chiming in too on the fact that public works absolutely has to be a part of these discussions. Um, so I know what we're doing now with the, with the Franklin Avenue redesign is um, talking with community members um, about what the street design could look like given the traffic that will be going through, et cetera, et cetera. So what could 21st Avenue look like? And I'm looking at the team here. What um, conversations have we had with Ventura Village and surrounding communities about um, what potentially this could look like? I've seen projects come before us where new housing developments come up and where residents come to speak about the streets and the safety. We're talking about how um, signs have been put up and pedestrian crossings and all of the things to make it safer given that there's a high amount of folks that will be living here that need to live here so the housing is a absolutely like we need it today um, but talk to me a little bit more how um, the community has been deliberately spoken with about traffic safety etc there's nothing that i can comment on in regard to enforcement but like how do you see this project um, blending in with the neighborhood in a way that promotes safety, especially on that 21st Street side that's now um, uh, relatively quiet except for the increase in traffic. So my question is around community engagement, environmental design I think was brought up for safety, which I am a firm believer in, but how can we make that backside lighter, brighter, safer, and um, just mesh well. Thank you, Commissioner Conley, uh, Pete Keeley, Collage Architects. So uh, we did start the initial conversations. Dr. Stately has been talking with the neighborhood and, and Sam as well. So they might have to talk a little bit more about the community engagement. We did meet, reach out to Public Works very early on in this project. One of our large concerns on this was pedestrian safety at Franklin Avenue. Um, there is, it is under reconstruction right now. They are uh, increasing the pedestrian safety uh, for um, uh, crosswalks. We worked with staff as well to increase um, sidewalks, uh, north-south connections as well as east-west connections, and then to make those safer, 
and then also along 21st Avenue to uh, put in the sidewalk to make it a little bit more pedestrian friendly in terms of street trees, two layers of street trees, lower plantings, decorative fences, and lighting. Uh, we also have two kind of art nodes that will talk about the kind of the cultural aspects of it as well on both the uh, southeast corner and the southwest corner. So we're really trying to spruce up what 21st uh, Street is. Uh, in discussion with Public Works, the circulation onto 21st Street actually really does help um, Franklin Avenue because otherwise it becomes a bottleneck on Franklin Avenue. So the ability to get out is actually um, probably a very helpful thing in terms of a larger pattern. And so we're looking at that kind of providing pedestrian walkways to get people from 21st um, across back to Franklin Avenue. I think the, uh, the new plaza area, the north-south connection, is a stronger, better connection with more lighting, more planting through that area as well. So I think we're looking at it all the way around the building. I know there has been some discussions, and I think we could continue to have some of those, but we really are trying to get better pedestrian safety, better um, lighting, uh, and then bike facilities as well. So the bike path through there is a clearer, more concise way to get north-south. Right. Thank you. Thank you again. I'm going to reintroduce myself as Samuel Bexon with Full Circle, <coughs> excuse me, Full Circle Indigenous Planning and Design, and I'm one of the design architects. And so, uh, thinking about what you're saying, uh, part of the strategy again was I was part of the design team that did the Great Streets Grant ten years ago, uh, that did extensive community engagement about how to make that neighborhood safer. And the one th one of the things that we identified was 21st Street, because right now I would rather walk on Franklin at night than 21st Street because it's a blank wall of, of basically just deliveries and there's chain link fence. And what we're doing is not only providing better eyes to the street, Franklin back is back at the 21st. And so uh, I, I also, uh, my family lived there when I was a baby. And so I lived on this site in a different development when the street used to go through. And so that, you know, when the, the city allowed the, the super block to happen, that's I think when the, the some of the problems happened, when you cut off pedestrian activity when you cut off access. So I'm more connected through streets and pedestrian activities, uh, getting rid of fences, uh, getting rid of blank walls that create uh, you know, really safety concerns has been something that we considered really carefully in the urban design and master plan of the project. So the American Indian Community Blueprint, you can refer to that, and also what we had done for the Great Seat Grant that talked about that pedestrian connectivity, the uh, crime prevention through environmental design, a four-sided building, not, not a one-sided building. And so we took design considerations in great detail and had uh, extensive discussions with the community over uh, 15 years uh, on this exact topic. Uh, hold, Commissioner, is your question answered? I don't want this to become a whole open. No. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was oh, okay. just going to speak I think that it was answered with how um, yeah. the safety on 21st, the lighting, all of that would um, has been relayed to the surrounding neighborhood who have specific sure. concerns about the streets. So, so. I'll just really quickly talk about the um, the amount of traffic that the clinic and the housing is likely to, are possibly potentially likely to increase. Um, so the clinic is actually prioritizing during the building phase. Uh, of the project, and also we will continue to do this after the building is built. Um, we're um, incentivizing and prioritizing um, and encouraging staff to carpool and to take uh, transit to the site. Um, and we'll build in incentives into our um, employee um, structure, employee compensation structure, to encourage them to do that because we want them to um, lower the carbon footprint, um, be more eff efficient, and also reduce traffic on the site. Um, the other thing I think I want to just really quickly say is that, um, you know, um, we are actually proposing to change the parking structure of like our lot, and then also we are working with our um, our t uh, the landowners to the to the left of us or like to the right to the east, um, which is the Aldi building. Um, they currently have really hor horrible parking. Um, if anybody ever goes to actually shop at Aldi, or if you have, you know, you're taking your life into your own hands managing that parking lot because um, actually when I went to work today, I almost got hit by somebody. 
So I think one of the things that we're trying to be as good of a relative as we possibly can, that is actually what we say about our clinic. We try to show up and be a good relative in everything we do, including to our neighbors and also the people we serve. But we also want to make sure that we're prioritizing safety of our residents and also our patients and also the neighborhood. So we're, look, we're balancing multiple things and we're trying to work with our partners to do that. So I think we're, we're being really intentional about that. Uh, Commissioner Ford. Um, I, I think this has the potential to be a, actually a very exciting project, but I have a question about the process and, um, uh, and staff talked, uh, you, you talked about, um, there, we, we know there are issues here yet and they'll get resolved in the future. I'm not sure what that means in that case. Um, I can take okay. a Thanks. chance at answering that one, but so Preliminary development review is an administrative process that happens before you see a land use application. So that is a process where plans are reviewed by planning staff, public work staff, our construction code services staff for building code compliance. Sometimes business licensing gets involved. You know, the fire department's looking at access. All of those things are coming in in a report. And that report is attached to the staff memo that you got for this project and it was typically in your packet but how the process works is if there are issues that are identified by public works those comments will be in that report and there's a revision process that happens after the public hearing where the applicant can incorporate all of the conditions of approval from the planning commission into their plans and they can also incorporate any recommendations from public works into their plans and they submit a revised set of plans that incorporate all of the comments for approval at one time. All of that happens before the building permit gets submitted. If there are major issues identified in a PDR report, it's not something that's going to get as far as the planning commission. Um, or if it does get to you, you're going to see conditions of approval from planning staff that are also asking for revisions to the plans. It's often things like, hey, you put the wrong standard plate number on your pedestrian crossing, or you know, we need to see this utility connection revised to this size, that sort of thing. If it's something like, hey, you can't have a curb cut right here, or we think this is too much traffic coming out onto this street, it's not going to get to you until that's addressed. So in this case, the comments were relatively minor. There is some language in there about continuing to work with Hennepin County throughout the Franklin Avenue street reconstruction, a lot of more just kind of boilerplate type comments uh, for this particular project. But it's never something where someone has PDR approval before it gets to planning commission because the process is still ongoing until the public hearing is closed. So uh, where does that leave the public who have concerns about, say, 21st Street at this point today? This is the proper forum for them to raise those comments and planning staff in working with Public Works to get a project to this point is well-versed and capable of answering those questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm not seeing... Any more questions or comments from commissioners? Would anyone like to make a motion? Or Commissioner Alper? I just, I just have one additional comment and then I'll make, I'll make a motion. But I, th I think we're, we're really failing people with traffic calming in our city. I mean, we, we had something like 600 projects submitted and we approved, what, 20? I, I, mean, I might have that, I'm sure I have the numbers off. But I, I think it's emblematic by the, number of people who come in and talk to us about traffic safety issues. So with that, I would like to um, move this forward with the staff recommendations. All right, we have a motion and a second to adopt staff recommendation. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Alper. Aye. Baxley. Aye. Campbell. Aye. Conley. Aye. Ford. Aye. Koski. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Olson. Aye. We have eight yeas and zero nays. 
All right, that motion passes. That concludes item number 11. And our next item is item number 12, and staff is Hillary Dvork. Good evening, uh, Planning Commissioners. I'm Hillary Devarek, Planner and CPED. Uh, this is a project um, at 3016 to 24 Fremont Avenue South. It is a site made up of three uh, individual single-family home lots. There are three single-family homes, or one single-family home on each of the three lots. The applicant is proposing to demolish those three houses and construct a new six-story, 78-unit residential building on the site. Uh, there would be 18 parking spaces on the ground floor accessed off of the north-south alley that runs through the block. Uh, the only application that is before you this evening is um, site plan review. It meets all of the standards of the zoning code. It meets all of the standards of the site plan review chapter except for the condition pertaining to shrubs. So we have um, re uh, conditioned the approval of this application before you to add those 14 or to have at least 14 shrubs provided on the site. I would also mention that the two ground level patios to the two walk up units are slightly over the 50 square feet. They measured at 57 and a half. So they do need to uh, trim them down by one square foot or one foot to get under the, to get to the 50 square feet. Um, just to orient you, Fremont is on the right hand side. The main entrance is here in the middle. These are the two walk-up units. They have um, lounge space and also um, a workout room here. Access to the um, on-site parking is from the back. This is a better floor plan that shows you that those access to the parking. Um, they did need an FAR premium. They are doing the environmental sustainability. They are doing a green roof. And here is the diagram that shows where the uh, green roof uh, elements will be located. Um, I'm going to just jump to the renderings. Again, they meet all of the standards of our site plan review chapter. Um, this is the building looking at it from Fremont. This is um, other, um, this is looking north at the building instead of south. And then this elevation is the um, north elevation of the building that faces the, um, what is currently a surface parking lot. Common Bond Communities is going to be proposing a housing project on this site, so you will not actually see this site from Lake Street once Common Bond builds a structure in this location. And then this is the uh, southwest corner of the building. Here is that alley and that parking ramp for seven points is here on the left. I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Hillary. Are there any questions for staff before we continue? I don't see any, thank you. Thank you. All right, I will open the public hearing. Is the applicant here and would they like to speak on this item? You can step forward, state your name and neighborhood um, for the record. Uh, hi, this is uh, Evan Williams on behalf of the applicant. Um, I'll keep my comments uh, brief, but um, you know we're pleased to present this in front of you all today. And uh, you know we think we meet all the goals uh, that you've outlined in the 2040 plan to bring more housing to Uptown. And we look forward to have more residents and people living in that community, um, you know, to really help it come back, bring more businesses, shops, and we think that this housing development will get that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll continue with the public hearing. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? Um, you will have two minutes. You can come to the podium now and state your name and neighborhood for the record. Commissioners, hi, my name is Philip Qualley. I live at 3021 Emerson Avenue South, uh, which is a block uh, east of the proposed development. It's a pleasure to come before you all today. Uh, I understand that the applicant has the zoning that they need to move forward. Uh, I would respectfully ask the commission to consider uh, laying it over one cycle if a motion might be made. 
First, I would like to ask respectfully that the developer continue to work with the residents in the neighborhood of Southeast Uptown. Uh, if you could bring up slide uh, number 15, please, which I think you'll see um, if it's possible to bring that up. Um, Hillary. These are just to yield my time. What are you looking for? Slide 15, please. Uh, this is not the packet that you just said. Let's move down. What are you, what, what yeah. are you looking for? The image, image from the street. Very good, right there, right back. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, commissioners. Thank you, Hillary. Mm -hmm. You know, the piece uh, is that uh, I wanted to comment on is, again, will the uh, applicant continue to work or please begin to work with the residential neighborhood? You will see a residential home in gray. A person lives there. They have lived there, maintained their home, and paid their taxes. And I'm sorry, as you look at uh, any uh, building that is six stories next to a residential two-story home, that six-story structure next to a residential home is detrimental to that residential home. We'd ask the de developer to please consider a roof line step down of the roof height uh, towards the residential neighborhood. And then finally, uh, the, uh, we understand that the current design has a party room that is currently uh, planned for the southwest corner over the residential neighborhoods. I will finish. We'd ask them to please move that to the north side so it's not immediately over residential homes. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Hi there. My name is Ane Fossey. I live at 3032 Fremont Avenue. It's uh, on the other side of that gray house. You can see a little corner of it. Um, there is that. Uh, there's a party room that's on the southwest corner. Uh, we, I agree with Phil that I asked that it be moved to maybe the north, uh, northwest corner or something like that. So it's not overlooking uh, my neighbor Steve Holt's house. Um, also visible in this picture, um, there's uh, inset balconies uh, throughout uh, going, you can't see the, the bottom two levels, but, but they are there in the, the um, other pictures. I'm sorry, I don't know how to work that. But um, looking at the uh, the overhead view, um, they're just not included in 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 the plans. That, so we don't really know what we're getting. Is there are there balconies overlooking the houses? Are there not balconies overlooking the houses? Um, I understand that they're within um, with the limits of, of parking. And uh, I just want to make a plea here because Fremont Avenue is nominally a one-way street going north, uh, legally a one-way street going north. In practice, it's a two-way street. Um, there are so many cars coming the wrong way, some of them very fast. Um, parking is at a premium. I pay, um, I think it's $40 a year for myself, $40 to have a guest. Um, right now it's not bad because there's some open houses, but it's going to be very bad then. Uh, we spoke with, with Evan about maybe getting parking vouchers for the, the, the residents there. Also, we're hoping that there's a privacy fence put up uh, so Steve's house is not right in the, in the way of that, right in the view. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Hi, my name is Lorna Rocky, and I live at 3032 Fremont Avenue uh, South, which is one house away from this development. Um, my parents, I'm an immigrant to this country. My parents bought that house as immigrants. They're both deceased now. Uh, fought very hard for this neighborhood. Uh, so we've been there since 1970. I came full circle, bought the house later. Um, a lot has happened in my neighborhood. Um, this proposal is for a six-story building with 78 units, but only 18 parking spots. Um, Anne talked about the parking, horrible. Um, I don't see how that's gonna be uh, viable, actually. Uh, more importantly for me, though, um, I went to high school 
where the um, Y is right now. I went to grade school where Callan Square is right now. Um, when George Floyd happened and when Winston Boogie Smith happened and all the things that happened with um, the police not coming a whole lot anymore, um, with the trauma in the neighborhood, uh, with trauma in general, um, my neighbor at the end of this block does not want to move. Um, he said he's very traumatized about it. I feel really bad that he feels forced out of his home. Um, I feel like the only safe thing in my life is my home. And when you're putting up a six-story building uh, that far away, or one house away, um, I don't feel safe. I want to make sure that my 1908 home is protected. I, I have nobody that's telling me that it's going to be. Um, I've worked really hard and I feel pretty traumatized, and I just want to make sure that this is all going to work. I want a win-win situation. I've tried to talk to the developer, hoping that we can do that. I haven't really heard anything about how they care to make sure that the neighborhood or my house is going to be OK. I have no idea how much time I have, but yeah, sorry, am I, I done? I just noticed it wasn't going either. What's that? <laughs> I just noticed it wasn't going either. Yeah, OK. So I was like, right. I don't know how much time I have. But you know, I mean, my bank was you know, burned down. My safety deposit box was gone. Um, I mean, there's just been so much trauma. And seriously, my, my home is the only safe place I know. And I'm really traumatized by the fact that I don't feel like I might even be safe in my own home. And I'm trying not to cry. but. It's real, and I work really hard to, I have, for this neighborhood. Um, a lot of the plans have been chucked that my father worked for, that I've worked for, that my neighbor at the end of the block that feels forced out has worked for. So that's really all. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Commissioners, Commissioners is there any? Commissioner Conley. Thank you. I would like um, the developers or the project planners to uh, talk a little bit about how um, they spoke with neighbors about things like how this project would impact uh, the residents. I'm always going to be one that's going to ask about community engagement, just so everyone's clear, uh, because it's important to me that when new projects pop up, that residents really know the really real impacts on how it will affect their livelihoods. Um, so I'd like uh, some details around how um, the project partners, developers reached out to neighbors, one. And then two, I'm really interested in, I think when this was first introduced, um, staff mentioned that there was some single family homes around it that will be gone. Were those empty? Were they boarded up? Were they sold? Or did you buy them? Just curious about those. Thank you. If someone from the applicant team wants to come up and respond. Uh, so regarding the question on the uh, purchases of the homes, the first home at 3024 was for sale uh, last fall. Uh, once that was purchased, then uh, you know, letters and, and uh, you know, discussions were had with the adjacent neighbors to see, you know, this is the, you know, you know what we're thinking um, for this block. Are you interested? Um, then the neighbor at 3020 was. They ended up selling their home. And then we continued the conversation with the uh, next door neighbor, both at 3028 and 3016. And then at 3016, uh, he was also interested in selling. So um, that's how. As far as purchasing the homes, uh, we've gone about that. Mm -hmm. These are all resident owned. I'm sorry. Were they all resident owned? Uh, one was a. Uh, it was. It was a tenant occupied. The other two were homeowners. Hi, I'm Jessica Harner with Christian Dean Architecture um, with the design team. Just wanted to address your question about engagement. Um, we did present this project to the neighborhood group, um, and I have had multiple conversations with Jerome Chateau, who is a design chair of their design, and one of the committees at the neighborhood group. Um, and I, I, I don't know if Evan, if you all had a meeting to discuss. I know there was discussions about having a neighborhood group meeting 
with Evan to discuss their concerns further. But we certainly have made it, to, you know, we have presented to the group, listened to feedback. Um, we, we certainly are happy to do things like move the party room and, and make accommodations to, to try to improve this for their experience. But um, we have certainly tried to be involved in community engagement and speak with shareholders. Thank you. Public hearing is closed. Thank you. Um, all right. I'm not seeing any other um, comments. I will make a motion to adopt staff recommendation. Um, you know, six stories is also a residential neighborhood, um, so it's kind of frustrating to hear that. Um, I'll also just say, you know, this meets all of the requirements, um, and not only does it meet all the requirements, it seems exceedingly um, appropriate for the site. So I'll move to adopt staff recommendation. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Alper. Aye. Baxley. Aye. Campbell. Aye. Conley. Aye. Ford. Aye. Koski. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Olson. Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. All right, that motion passes, and that concludes item number 12. Our next item is item number 14. And staff is Madel Muta. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Madel Muta, and I am here to present the Exterior Building Materials Guidelines. So the proposed Exterior Building Material Guidelines and the proposed Zoning Code Text Amendment would introduce a set of guidelines that will guide the application of exterior building materials. The intent of the guidelines is to provide design guidance for materials to ensure quality, lasting, affordable, equitable, equitable and beautiful built, urban built environment for all communities in the entire city. Exterior building materials have a variety of impacts on the quality and safety of the built environment, including life safety, building durability and sustainability, housing costs, and aesthetic compatibility with the existing and historic building stock. Minneapolis has been ex experiencing strong growth in population over the last decade that has brought a significant amount of new development to our city and new architectural technologies to the marketplace. The proposed guidelines are intended to strengthen the city's ability to regulate and communicate the standards by which we evaluate new construction. So these guidelines are a one-page document um, that are meant to be concise and that are meant to um, basically create a baseline for the design of buildings across the entire city of Minneapolis. So the guidelines would apply to new buildings and additions subject to site plan review. Uh, they would not be apl applicable to one to three unit residential buildings, which are regulated differently, um, including incentives for um, durable materials. The guidelines are also not applicable to recladding of buildings that were never subject to site plan review. So in these guidelines, um, they, they place a greater emphasis on utilizing more durable materials at the base of buildings to enhance the public, um, the public realm and also the pedestrian experience and they allow less durable materials to be used at the middle, top, or the trim and accents of a building. So the guidelines themselves would not be part of the zoning code, but they would actually be referenced in the code. Um, in chapter 550, um, 570 building walls. Um, so at the end of this uh, little section here, it has a reference that says, exterior building materials shall comply with adopted exterior building materials guidelines. Uh, 
And the reason for, for this um, being guidelines instead of in the actual uh, zoning code themselves is to administer greater flexibility um, through alternative compliance if the applicant is able to demonstrate that the materials meet the intent of the guidelines, the city's code of ordinances, and also the comprehensive plan. Uh, so these guidelines would also provide more flexibility for missing middle residential buildings, which are four to 20 units. Um, they would also provide more equitable and predictable design outcomes for buildings in all parts of the cities. Um, they would ensure high quality, durable, and sustainable materials are used and also would encourage a higher quality material at the base of buildings and other surfaces near the public realm. Uh, so some of the, the process, um, well, this has been a long process to get to where we are now. Um, we've been using um, a set of guidelines from 2014 that has like greatly influenced what we have now. Um, we also um, have, have conducted peer city research to understand how other cities are regulating exterior building materials and have gotten a lot of the new um, guidelines from there, just you know, depending on best practices in other cities. And that, again, I wanna um, emphasize that this has been an iterative process. We have gone to designers, to developers, um, to other planners to, to get feedback on the results or on the guidelines themselves and have um, adjusted accordingly to test different suggestions. Um, um, so some of the peer research that we did, um, again, the, ta the table, which is like the main portion of the guidelines, can, was um, largely modeled after Madison, Wisconsin. So they have a, a table that is very similar to the one that we have. Um, of course, we tailored our, um, the, the table to meet our needs. Uh, we also looked at other cities like Des Moines, Iowa, which has um, a very extensive set of, of um, exterior building guidelines, which is actually found in their code, um, and they break it down um, between major and minor um, materials. They even have a percentage of a breakdown of where materials can go and also a list of prohibited materials. Um, and I, I also want to emphasize like um, that uh, these guidelines are even a, a lot more strict than what we have, right? They even um, will, um, will mention like the depth of, of how far material should go. So that's nowhere near what we have. Um, other, oh, I just also wanted to say, we um, also did other um, research on cities that are neighboring us. Uh, so Egan and Woodbury, for example, they also have um, classification of materials lists that are uh, a lot more strict than what we have. So um, some of the, the main reasons that we're doing this, again, uh, building design and exterior materials have an equity component that relates directly to the city's goals of eliminating disparities between different communities within the city. Without clear design expectations, that are codified, development is often shaped by less formal and more subjective processes at the local neighborhood level. So wealthier and more organized communities have, that have a stronger political, political infrastructure and have more time to be able to dedicate to local development um, will historically be more successful at pushing higher quality developments um, in their neighborhoods. Um, so again, by having these gui guidelines, we are creating a base line for all the designs in the city, um, in all the neighborhoods. Um, I also wanna um, highlight the other two goals that we are focusing on, again, is um, focusing on affordable and accessible housing, um, while not forgetting to also provide a high quality physical environment for, for our residents. Uh, this slide here uh, shows some of the language from Minneapolis 2040. Um, so as you can see, a lot of uh, the reasons that we're doing this right is, is rooted directly in policy of, um, of guiding exterior building materials and in, in their design. Um, I just wanna quickly go over some of the topics that were discussed at um, the Cal meeting on June 15th. Uh, so one of the topics that was discussed is um, sustainability. And I want to um, just clarify that what we are considering to be sustainable materials in this document 
um, is our materials that have a greater lifespan from the time that they were installed um, until the time that they have to be replaced. Um, and so we, we do have more extensive regulations regarding sustainability, but that's not found in these particular guidelines. Uh, they can be found in the zoning code in chapter 540 in the belt form overlay districts uh, for premiums and also chapter 550 development standards in planned unit developments. Uh, the other topic that was brought up um, is a specific guideline within the document that says um, the appearance of materials of the rear and side walls shall be similar to and compatible with the front of the building. Generally, the primary exterior materials incorporated on the front of the building must be incorporated on all sides. Uh, so I just wanted to um, clarify that this is taken directly out of policy language um, from the comprehensive plan, policy five, um, action step D. And some of the reason um, behind this is because since Minneapolis 2040 does allow for a larger developments um, adjacent to lower density developments, we want to be a good neighbor, right? Um, so increasing, like, um, so having, having the building materials compatible on all sides um, will hopefully create a better environment for, neighbor, uh, for neighboring developments and also increase the, the level of acceptance um, of more housing options in the neighborhoods. So uh, here's an image you can see. Uh, I think it's about a six-story building. Um, it's, it's very clearly visible on the backside of it, um, it like within the neighborhood um, next to you know, two-story two -story homes, one-story developments. And the same thing with this image here. Uh, you can see, again, um, the front of the building is just as visible as the sides. Uh, the other, another topic um, was that of style and design. I think there um, was a, a expressed concern that the guidelines would favor particular styles of design um, and that they could result in similar designs across the city, uh, which is not what we intended. Uh, we would like to clarify that we, we would like many, to see many types of design um, and also have written the guidelines in a way to the designers have enough creative freedom and also flexibility to, uh, to z design how they like. Um, we also wanted to clarify that we would like to encourage a simple palette of high quality materials rather than like a patchwork of, of design or of materials on a building. Um, and then EFIS, so that um, stands for Exterior Insulating Finishing System. Um, that was another um, topic that was discussed. And it was previously not allowed at all um, in, in our table, but we've changed that and updated it to be allowable at the top of buildings and also as a trim or accent material. Um, and then lastly, I think there was also a concern that these guidelines would slow down the, the application process. Um, again, that's not our intent. And also, um, I just wanna reiterate that these um, guidelines were basically um, uh, based off of the 2014 guidelines. So a lot of it is not new, just the, um, the table, I guess. Okay, so these are the guide, uh, within the guidelines themselves. Um, I'm just gonna go over it. So again, um, the purpose of the exterior building material guidelines is to provide design guidance for materials to ensure a quality, lasting, affordable, and beautiful uh, urban built environment for all communities. Um, again, just reiterating the fact that this is a baseline um, for the design. Uh, the guiding principles, priorities, and general intent of the guidelines is to ensure high quality and durability, sustainability, and climate conscious selection of materials, consistent and equitable outcomes, new develop, uh, to ensure that new development is compatible and complementary to existing urban and architectural fabric, um, and that human scale elements and building articulation is done. So this is the, the table that's found uh, within the building guidelines. Um, and again, it, it breaks down uh, the different uh, exterior building materials based on where they are allowed um, in a building, so breaking it down into the building base or podium, the middle or tower, the top, um, a trim or accent material, and then some of the materials have specific standards 
uh, for that material. Um, so again, um, over the years, CPED has done and, and gathered a significant amount of research that has helped to inform these guidelines. Along with all this research, CPED has also conducted a significant amount of internal and external outreach um, over the years for consensus among our development partners, um, including members of the development community, design professions, and affordable housing colleagues. So, and we think that um, what we are proposing here pre represents a fair and comprehensive as assessment of that input. Um, I would, so some of the, some of the factors that, um, that we considered um, and research in concluding which materials are uh, may be allowed nearest to the public realm include material composition, um, application, and also appearance. Um, so in the table, you can see that materials such as brick, concrete, glass, and stone masonry are more desirable at the building uh, near the public realm um, at the base or podium because they're subject to more pedestrian traffic and are more susceptible to wear and tear. So other materials are more desirable where there is less pedestrian traffic or further away from the public realm, uh, such as the middle or the top of the, the, of the building. This way their lifespan can be elongated and they won't experience problems with vandalism, snow removal equipment, and cars, and et cetera. I would also like to point out the table um, again. Uh, the table does not apply to one to three unit residential buildings, um, and that wood composite materials are considered to be a wood material. So um, again, looking at the table, brick um, is allowed everywhere on a building. Uh, CMU is allowed at the, at the base of the building as a trim or accent material, um, and it has an extra standard A, which is um, that CMUs shall not comprise more than 30% of any building and plain face CMU shall not be used on any building wall adjacent to the public street or sidewalk. Uh, moving on, concrete is allowed everywhere on the building. EFIS is allowed at the top or as a trim or accent material. Fiber cement is allowed at the middle, top, and as a trim or accent. And um, here we have this other standard B, which is that the material is allowable for use at the base of residential buildings, two and a half stories or less and any residential with four to 20 units. So again, we're trying to allow for more flexibility for missing middle uh, homes. And then we have glass that is allowed everywhere. Uh, metal panels not allowed at the base, um, unless, again, it is that missing middle um, uh, scale. Uh, stone masonry is allowed everywhere on a building. Stucco is allowed um, everywhere but the base, unless it is a missing middle building. And then wood, the same thing. And lastly, we have vinyl siding that is allowed as a trim or accent material. So the definitions. Um, here, uh, let me read the base or podium definition. Uh, the lower most stories of the building that are the primary interface between the building and the public realm. The base of a tall building is also known as the podium. The base includes the first story of the building and can include the first story up to the sixth story dependent on context and building height. Uh, so we have gotten a lot of comments on the base um, definition, um, and we just would like to clarify that we intentionally left it vague to provide enough flexibility for designers and applicants to decide what the base is. Um, of course, the base of a two-story is vastly different from that of a 30-story building, and could even um, be different on buildings the same height, depending on what the style of design is. Um, so, of course, if we were more clear with that definition, it could result into restrictive of guidelines. Um, and again, we want to be put, um, more favor favorable to different styles of designs. Uh, we want variety and we want to allow design professionals to be able to design um, as they will. Um, and then moving on to the middle or tower definition. Um, the stories in the part of the building that extends from the base of the building to the top of the building. And the top definition, the uppermost stories of the building and rooftop mechanical equipment and enclosures. Uh, here is a diagram that shows um, what the different base might look like on um, low rise, mid rise, and high rise. Uh, the top image is showing um, where some of those more durable materials should be concentrated at. 
um, like again at the base and near to the public realm. And then the lower three are um, where less durable materials may be concentrated away from the public realm. Um, here we also have um, this language on the right side of the table um, that says um, authorized materials are selected based on durability and compatibility in an urban context. Applicants may, dis may demonstrate how new materials and technology not listed above meet the intent of the city's site plan review regulations. Um, and then flexibility in the utilization of materials may be considered through alternative compliance if the design fulfills the intent of the city's zoning ordinance and comprehensive plan. So again, we have a lot of room worked into, um, into the guidelines for, for flexibility. Uh, this, for example, is a building that has metal on, on the base um, and also the, the rest of the building. Um, so this is an example of a building that we might um, or allow alternative compliance um, because they, again, they have the, um, the metal on a, a place that's not as, um, as busy. It doesn't have to, to deal with the wear and tear of like pedestrians walking by or again, the snow removal, the um, vandalism, everything. Uh, continuing to the rest of the guidance, um, so buildings should not include more than three exterior materials on each elevation. This excludes windows, doors, and foundation materials. Uh, the application of materials of the rear and side walls shall be similar to and compatible with the front of the building. Generally, the primary exterior materials incorporated on the front of the building must be incorporated onto all sides. And again, that's found in policy language that we have. Um, designs should incorporate, incorporate a strong and grounded building base. The use of brick, concrete, glass, and stone masonry is encouraged where practical in all exposures and elevations facing the public realm. Material changes should occur at architectural intersections such as recesses, setbacks, or massing changes. And material changes should be articulated through transitional detailing such as substantial trim, coursing, or a reveal. Um, and the last two guidelines are that materials that create an oil canning effect are discouraged. Um, here's an image of what that looks like. Um, and then lastly, historic preservation standards take precedence. Um, so that is all and that I have for you today. Thank you, Medell. Um, Commissioner Meyer has a question. Thank you. So. Um, I, I want to understand what the change is from the status quo because I'm, I'm confused about it. So you're saying that it's more flexible than the guidelines for site, line, site plan review that we've had since 2014. But we, we have you know, a really big stack of paper from um, materials producers and other people who are opposing these restrictions. So is this just formalizing restrictions that have always been there in the zoning code? Um, I'm just trying to understand why people sure. are so, so opposed if we're making it more flexible for them. So it, it is a lot more flexible than what it used to be. Before we would, um, there used to be percentages allowed on, on different faces of, um, of the building. Um, and also, again, um, and then in 2021, um, we tried to codify those standards or the, the guidelines and um, they were also even more restrictive. Um, so after hearing the feedback that from, um, you know, people that are concerned about different materials, we have allowed um, EFIS, for example, that was not um, allowable on any surface, um, on any building wall. Now we have it allowable at the top or as a term or accent material. Yeah, so I remember the presentation back in 2021, and this is definitely more flexible than that, especially on wood and, and smaller buildings. But can you do a compare and contrast with this proposal and the 2014? Like, wh wh where is that different? Um, is, that still uh, is it? Yeah, um, basically like, um, apart from the table, because the table is like really like the newest thing that was added, um, the rest of the language like, um, like, like this guidance, for example, that I read off at the end was all from 2014. Um, and then, Again, the, the, the main difference being uh, this table. Okay. Um, so I'll let the people who 
came here tonight, you know, elaborate more on what it is about the changes that they d don't like. But um, I do have one other question before, before we, they move into that. Um, can you can we just go over what sustainability means again? So you, you said in your comments that it's about how long the materials last. So, it, but then it also in, in the guidelines, um, you they mentioned climate consciousness, but I didn't see it mentioned. I, I didn't see climate mentioned anywhere else um, in, in in the report. So, how 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 does climate consciousness relate to sustainability in this context? In this context, I would say well. Again, just to clarify, the, when we are talking about sustainable materials in this particular document, in, in these guidelines, we are considering those to be from the time that they are installed to the time that they have to be replaced. So we want materials that are going to last longer, um, and, you know, don't have to be maintenanced as frequently as other materials. Um, and then the more extensive regulations that we have on sustainability on climate consciousness can be found in the code itself. Um, so, so not so much here in these guidelines. Okay, thank you. Um, Campbell and then Kosky. I have a similar question to Commissioner Meyer, which is, um, you know, we have this academic study in front of us that has a whole variety of scientific data that I haven't had a chance to fully, I don't even know if I could ever fully understand this, but it's here and it, it the I'm taking the provider's word for it that in it it has a variety of information about um, the sustainability of some of these materials. And I think my question, similar to Commissioner Meyer, is that we talked a lot about durability. Um, and through, and I'm not a what person, I leave that up to, com to Commissioner Baxley because he's the architect who knows all these things. I'm, I'm more listening for the why. Why are we changing these things? And I heard a lot of sort of aligning the best practices from other cities, um, conversations with designers, developers, and planners helped contribute to this. Um, so I have two questions. Number one, what, what does durability mean? And how are we assessing it? And number two, did we solicit um, uh, input from anyone who can help us um, use data to drive decisions as it relates to some of these materials? So. Um Yeah, um, I mean, we have, like I said, met with architects and developers, um, and this, uh, um, the, the research that we have done, again, has, has not just been for this set of gu guidelines, it's been since, um, you know, um, the 2021, um, getting input from them and also changing it according to, to uh, research that we have also found of what materials are more durable um, in terms of, like, their maintenance, um, and, and also, again, like that wear and tear um, that we've also seen. Um, I mean, a lot of this is also based on the planner's experience over, you know, 15 to 20 years, um, just with like the day-to-day -day seeing what what is successful, um, what is more durable here in, in our city. Okay. So. Mr. Koski. Thank you, Chair Olson. Um, thank you for the presentation and thorough information. I guess also piggybacking on some of these questions, I like the visual of the chart, and I think that's really helpful. Uh, is there any way, though, I mean, I hear you said that EFIS, for example, was not allowed. So if we were to have a 2014 chart, would EFIS would not be on the chart, is what I'm understanding, okay. right? Are there any other materials on here that have significant changes such as that or are added? If you could just maybe go over, I mean, I'm just make, throwing this out here, but vinyl, like would they have been able to use vinyl at would there have been four checks prior and now there's just one? Or um, just wondering if you could help us understand the difference because I think I that's think, helpful. Sure, so a lot of these, um, a lot of these materials were on that list. Um, I don't have the list with me, but they, it was more restrictive in the, in the sense that we uh, would regulate the percentages um, on the different, um, like on the different sides of the building. Okay, so besides the percentage, mm -hmm. but all of these uh, other materials were able to be used prior. Okay, so um, um, metal and wood, we are now also more flexible. Okay, so EFIS, metal, and wood are now become more flexible, and then also I understand the broader like percentage is being able to be used. Percentage, yes. Okay. Um, there's also, um, 
like, I'm trying to remember if it was the 2014 guidelines that were also like, or actually no, it was the 2021 that even um, specified like the thickness of material. Um, but we're trying to get away from like those like very, very detailed um, regulations. And again, just providing a baseline for, for the design. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Meyer. Just one more clarifying question about um, how climate is treated in, in the building code. So, so w when we talk about it, there, there are two different aspects of um, how the building materials affects climate. One is uh, the embodied uh, climate so, uh, or carbon pollution. So like how much is upfront in the materials themselves for the production of the concrete or whatever material. Um, and then there's the operational um, climate impact, which is the energy efficiency. So um, does the building code say anything about the embodied carbon pollution or is it just about the energy efficiency and operational carbon? I believe it's energy efficiency. Okay, thank you. I have a couple questions. Um, is, this, is this a legislative action so we are advising the council? Okay, I'm seeing a nod. Um, my other question is, like you said, the all four sides is in policy, so you're saying that would have to be a comprehensive plan amendment before we would even talk about it. Okay. Um, I think maybe just for the benefit of everyone in the room, before we start the public hearing, could you talk about the alternative compliance process and how someone could vary from what we're seeing here and what that would look sure. like? So um, again, that language is, is also found on the guidelines themselves. Um, so basically, um, an applicant could propose alternative compliance um, by, by demonstrating that a new material or that material um, should be allowed on the base. For example, um, you know, I highlighted this building. Um, it does meet many of the, the, the different um, intents and goals behind the guidelines. So they could propose alternative compliance and then get that. Okay. Can you explain in alternative compliance, what that means just for the people in the room? Like oh, sure. what? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so basically, um, I could maybe answer that one as well. So alternative compliance is something um, where you can ask for flexibility from our site plan review chapter, and it doesn't require an additional land use application. So typically when you deviate from a provision in the ordinance, you're applying for a variance. However, when it comes to site plan review, it's a little bit more flexible where it's something the applicant can ask for through the actual site plan review application process, and then the commission can grant it based on findings such as, you know, is there something here that makes it impractical for them to comply with the letter of the law on that? Are they doing something as an alternative that doesn't exactly meet the language, but it meets the intent of the code? So you often see those, I'm sure you saw several tonight in reports that were in front of you for things like shrubs, or perhaps someone isn't exactly complying with the window percentage, but there are some windows that we're not counting because they're too high off the ground. Um, those sorts of things are very common, and it's something um, that is definitely more flexible than asking for a variance. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions from staff. Thank you, Madel. Um, so I will continue with the public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Um, I guess the city is the applicant, so there's no applicant to speak. Um, but uh, if anyone would like to come up to the podium and speak, um, you can come forward, state your name and address for the record, um, and proceed with your comments. And again, everyone will have two minutes, and it'll be on the clock. Well, I was, oh. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. I know I was at least second on the list, so. Uh, my name's Joel Fowler. I'm the business manager at Labor's Local 563. Our union hall is in Northeast, the current one that we have, and our new union hall will be over on the east side, and I believe Ward 6. We represent about 10,000, almost 11,000 members in the state of Minnesota, North Dakota. 
here to speak on uh, the exterior building material guidelines as quickly as I can, so bear with me. I believe we sent some information earlier uh, today to Medell and some of the staff. Uh, a lot of the information that you guys may have in front of you or will soon get. Uh, we made a mistake when we first sent it and didn't have the attachments, and that's on us. Uh, just some technical difficulties. We're laborers, not computer guys. So. That being the case, I just want to touch on a few different things that are in the 2040 plan. Uh, also, things that were brought up in the last meeting, affordability, carbon intensity, and durability, separate from the jobs that we would lose as laborers in this if it happened, specifically around EFs or external insulation finishing systems, as well as stucco. Um, so on the affordability side of it, you, uh, we have RS Means, who did a quick study. Uh, that was uh, the end of quarter one here in 2023, so it's very accurate, or I should say very timely. Uh, and it shows that EFS is a, uh, a very affordable option, especially, especially for the aesthetics that it provides in uh, comparison to uh, concrete, masonry, uh, insulated concrete panels, um, uh, glazing on a, on a steel curtain wall, et cetera. It is a much more affordable option, and some of that information is in there. Um, so as you talk about disparities and trying not to increase them with the 2040 plan, you have a very nice aesthetically pleasing to the eye uh, product that you can install on the exterior or of a building as a cladding system that is much more affordable than other similar products uh, for the aesthetic that you provide. It's not a structural system in the sense that it's supposed to hold up the building. It's a cladding, so it's for insulation purposes. Uh, making sure there isn't water intrusion and uh, for the looks and aesthetics. So recently, some of the different, uh, Eve, wow, I got a long ways to go. <laughs> Sorry, I have the list now. So was, were you Joe? Was that, is yeah. your name Joe? Okay, so up next is Conrad Zabowski. I didn't say that right. Hello, this is uh, the Wiseman Art Museum that you can see is full metal cladding. Uh, it was built in 1993, exactly 30 years ago, um, which is actually how old I am too, so uh, we've been around for 30 years. And uh, I want to give it as an example, and there's many examples in the city of Minneapolis, including that apartment building in uh, the North Loop, and also the Guthrie Theater, and other buildings that are all metal paneling uh, all the way to the grass or to the sidewalk. And I think um, when we're talking about the durability, things like that, um, it's interesting to me that glass is a material is allowed on every piece of the building, even though glass is the least durable material of all of those. I know for sure because my building recently had uh, glass at the base of our building be broken and two bikes were stolen yet last night. So, you know, that happens a, a lot in Minneapolis. Not that I don't like glass, but you know, I wish it was a little bit stronger. Um, so I think, you know, I was talking to some other people uh, who I wish they could be here tonight to speak as well. But um, given just that these building material decisions are an aesthetic decision, all the building materials on the chart are allowed on some part of the building. So you know, if there is a hurricane, right, which hopefully won't happen in Minneapolis but there's uh, allowance on some part of the building. So it's not a question of whether they are storm resistant, heat resistant, cold resistant, anything like that. It's a question of what it looks like. And I think that's more of a question of the activation on the street. So uh, I know there's a lot of conversations here about how can we make our buildings more better for the neighborhood. I think we should focus on street activation and not what colors and number of panels and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Troy Cox. Good evening. My name is Troy Cox. I'm with Local 563. I'm a longtime member of 27 years with Construction and General Labors. I'm here to talk about how it's going to affect our contractors and our workers. We got about 25 EFIS contractors with an average of two workers. Uh, that puts us at 50 workers, jobs, and careers. Uh, the stucco. We have about 35 crews with five members per crew. That's about 175 workers. Uh, if you add that up, it comes to just a rough estimate of 60 contractors, 225 families. Uh, with that being said, uh, these aren't just members. Uh, jobs, they're careers. These guys go to work every day in the city. Uh, they put a beautiful product up. And I just want you guys to keep in mind as we move forward just think about the careers, the families, 
and our workers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Pedrosi. Hi, my name's Steve Pedrosin. I'm, well, I guess I'm the former director of the Minnesota Lath and Plaster Bureau. Uh, I wrote two articles on EIFS that are attachments to the CPED staff report. I hope you've had the opportunity to read them. And with that said, I would like to go through something of the staff report I found a little disturbing. Quote, CPED conducted a significant amount of research and outreach to, the, to establish the basis for the proposed amendment in partnership with stakeholders from the development community, affordable housing partners, design professions, and material manufacturers. Minnesota Lath and Plaster Bureau has been around since 1953. We have represented the signatory union lathing and plastering contractors on many technical issues. No one ever reached out to us. The Minnesota Drywall and Plasters Association was never contacted. Plasters Local 265 was never contacted. The plasters and cement masons have a wonderful training facility. I'd like to take you there. It was never contacted. Also in the room today are two plastering supply distributors. No one from staff reached out to them. There is also an, an EAFS manufacturer with corporate headquarters in Shakopee. No one from staff reached out to them either. The Minnesota Building Trades Council was not aware of this issue until we brought it to their attention. In closing, CPED staff has been working on the zoning code text amendment since 2021. They put this amendment out late Thursday last week, which allows us basically one and a half business days to rebut. I ask you, how is this significant outreach? With that said, I respectfully suggest that any vote on this amendment be postponed until it can be fairly and objectively addressed. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Doug Sweet. Is there a Doug? I haven't changed my name. No, that's all right. We'll, <laughs> well, maybe we'll come back to it. Um, Stephen Doggett? Doggett? Sorry. Good afternoon. Um, I've already submitted a document for, your, uh, for the public record, and I'll just focus on a few points and then my recommendations. First of all, the staff report has put much emphasis on the definition or the topic of durability. However, it is not defined once in the staff document, not once. Moreover, the expectations for durability are not cited. That's important. The industry practice is that any type of expression of durability is expressed on the basis of service life. What does that mean? It means how really how long will a building material last, assuming it is maintained in a certain way. That is not expressed in this document. Eves, Modern EFs has a life, service life of over 50 years. That's in line with industry practice and industry standards for long life buildings. These are buildings that have long life, which is also at greater than 50 years. Thirdly, EFs, the service life of EFs has a service life that equals or exceeds three building materials that have, that are currently authorized. They include wood, composite wood, and fiber cement. So what I'm recommending here, I want to ask one more point. The point was brought up early today regarding the height of where EFS is currently authorized. Right now, it's authorized only at the top of the building. Ironically, that's the place of the building. That is the location of the building receiving the highest exposure. By that logic, that EFS should be installed throughout the entire building not just at the highest part. But again, that is the most arduous part for any building, is the part of height. My recommendation, remove all restrictions of EFS, not just at the base, all restrictions. In lieu of that, I'm recommending postponement of these amendment processes so we can review what, what has not been disclosed to date. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marcus Kazenga. Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Marcus Kaisinger, representing James Hardy Building Products. We make fiber cement cladding. And I just want to say at the outset that we're supportive of the staff's effort to update the guidelines. We think they're a little, they're, they're quite a bit better than what they were back in 2014. Um, we do uh, have, uh, 
have a clarification that we'll request. Um, but just maybe to familiarize yourself with James Hardy building products, uh, we make fiber cement cladding materials. It's in the form of planks, it's in the form of panels, it's in the form of many types of material, uh, many shapes of materials, panels, shakes, etc., trim boards. Um, we've been around since 1990. Um, there are uh, examples of fiber cement installations in the greater Minneapolis area that have been installed since 2000. Uh, so it's, we have a long history of being used in this area, just uh, perhaps not on as much multifamily uh, buildings in the city of Minneapolis as we think uh, you know, uh, would be appropriate. Um, now, I'm a company representative, but don't, in, in terms of durability, don't take my word for it. Um, FEMA rates our product as uh, uh, highly flood resistant. It's its highest rating, in in, and it's actually one of the approved materials that are built in flood zones. Uh, we're rated by the California Fire Marshal for use in woodland urban interface zones. So we're the wildfires out in our California. We're rated by the Miami-Dade uh, County uh, for high velocity hurricane zones. So um, it's other, other agencies, other entities have looked at our material and determined that it is very durable. Now we recognize, as staff has, that perhaps on the base of a building, um, where there's more street traffic, more impact, et cetera, that um, some additional durability might be required. So our, our question is about the definition of the base. Currently, the def definition of the base is up to, it's the, it's the first floor, potentially up to six floors. And that's very vague. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go one more time to Doug Sweet. All right, um, Bill Egan. Okay, uh, I'm Bill Egan, I'm principal of Bill Egan Group. I have a consulting business that specializes in buildings and construction products. Prior to that, I worked for 35, more than 35 years actually as in technical engineering roles for an Eves and Stucco manufacturer. <clears throat> I was also one of the speakers on the July 6 call with CPED staff and hopefully provided additional information that gave some additional insight into Eves. Uh, it was great to see that the latest building material guidelines recognize Eves, how it does unnecessarily limit use to tops and accents of buildings, while most of the materials can be used at middle and tower areas as well as the lower portions. The, uh, the recent CPED staff uh, discusses Eve's application concerns about attachment directly to facades without a means for moisture exit. Clearly, this is based on the original barrier systems, which are on that handout that I provided and kind of gives a difference between the Eve systems and the Eve sewer drainage systems. <clears throat> I should also point out the Eve sewer drainage systems, they have, and I know there's always concern and questions about moisture in Eve's. But it should, the thing I want to point out is that the Eastwood drainage systems include a water resistant barrier, or people refer to it as Tyvek, um, in addition to a means with drainage, similar to other claddings that are allowed under the material, building material guidelines, such as brick, stucco, fiber, cement, and wood. Um, so it's unclear why Eastwood drainage would not be allowed in, on buildings and types of, on building middles and tops when it's still in many other respects. Eastwood drainage provides many benefits and should be allowed as a minimum for the same years that, uh, in which stucco is allowed. And I show that on that chart on there. So in that chart, you can, you can see that I put a little check mark in uh, so that it would be similar to stucco. And I've also made the correction that it's not Eve's, it should be Eve's with drainage systems. So I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. All right, um, Stefan Sears. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Steven Sears, and I am the executive director of EMA, which is the Industry Association for the Exterior Insulation and Finish Systems Industry, a non-load-bearing exterior cladding used in the U.S. since the 1960s. Thank you for this opportunity, and thanks, too, for no longer totally disallowing EFs in these guidelines. EFs have been a part of the International Building Code for nearly two decades and have continually evolved. 
While the original sealed eaves are rarely used now, today's eaves with drainage is trusted for all kinds of building applications, styles, and geographies. We appreciate that the Title 20 amendment is not a total ban, but it would severely limit the use of eaves compared to legacy claddings. As presented, the city's eaves restriction would obstruct the city's ability to address Minnesota's new commercial building code that calls for an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. EFs are much better suited to deal with, deal with these new requirements than legacy claddings. Why? Because the R value of the EFs insulation, which is the measure of a building's heat efficiency, is 20 times greater or more than brick, stone, concrete, stucco, and plain glass. EFs are also a more affordable option. On a new Minneapolis apartment building, the installed cost of brick is 60% greater than the installed cost of EFs. We ask that eaves with drainage be allowed on the same building levels that stucco is, or delay action on these guidelines for further study. Relegation of eaves would not only hamper the city's carbon reduction efforts, it would also increase costs for Minneapolis's building owners, contractors, and tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barry Lassiter. Uh, good evening. Thank you. My name is Barry Lassiter. I am the technical service manager for SECA Corporation representing Synergy, Finestone, and Parx Wall Systems based in Shakopee, Minnesota. I've been with Synergy and the SECA Corporation for 32 years and work out of the Shakopee office along with 95 other colleagues supporting the East industry. East has had a long history of offering durable, affordable, sustainable, and aesthetically pleasing buildings for over 100 years. Benefits of EAFs, numerous code compliances, energy efficiencies, sustainable, aesthetic versatility and cost effective. It can basically deliver almost any desired look and feel at a fraction of the cost. It's durable. It's an engineered composite cladding that can be used to create highly durable systems. Water and air management. EFs manage air and water through the air and water resisted barrier and adhesively attached exterior insulation. The insulation board is attached with drainage channels. These channels effectively eliminate moisture before it has had an opportunity to enter the wall cavity. EFs with its many benefits helps deliver high performance, aesthetically pleasing buildings. As a manufacturer of EFs products based in the state of Minnesota, if affordable, sustainable, and aesthetically versatile buildings are priorities for the city of Minneapolis, the requested action is to allow EFs at a minimum with drainage in the middle tower section similar to stucco or delay the decision until all the data has been reviewed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ann Lutz. Good afternoon, I'm Ann Lutz. I'm a lifelong Minneapolis resident. I currently live across the river at Larif Condos. My husband, Tim, and I um, launched uh, a construction materials distribu distribution company, the Lutz Company, over 40 years ago. We are the Minnesota exclusive distributors of DriveIt, which is one of the leading EFS systems in the country. We, our customers are plastering and drywall contractors of all sizes, from two-person crews to large drywall companies with numerous small businesses in between. Many are second and third generation companies dedicated to the plastering trade and also proud union members. EFS is not a new product in Minnesota. Our database of projects goes back to 1983, we have supplied Drive at Eves on over 25,000 projects in Minnesota to date, representing many millions of square feet. 
In Minneapolis, drive-it cladding is installed on over 1,000 buildings, including public schools, fire stations, churches, healthcare facilities, hotels, and retail buildings. Older downtown projects, there's too many to name, but a few are include the 22-story Lowe's Minneapolis Hotel, completed in 2006, Minneapolis Convention Center, two phases from 1989 and 1994, 20,000 square feet there, and the 10-story um, People Serving People Shelter at 3rd and Portland, completed in 2020, 2002. I want to confirm that we continue to supply EFs in Minneapolis today, despite any rules which are confusing to us, we do supply EFS projects. I can think of one right now in the North Loop, one in South Minneapolis on Minneaha Avenue. It is happening. Um, please consider that the adoption of this amendment will have a serious economic impact on many small businesses and employers that are dedicated to the local EFS industry. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right, I think it's Sandy Thiel. Maybe? Oh, I was not close. <laughs> That's a left-handed slant writing. My name is Chuck Thiel. Uh, I actually work for my wife who owns a company, uh, American Construction Supplies up in Blaine. I'm just following my competitor, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Lutz there. Um, we both agree on one thing, and that thing is that there should not be any restrictions on EFs in the city of Minneapolis. And I find it rather ironic that we're sitting in this council room and you look around at the walls and the ornateness of the work that was done in here by plasterers and now you're looking to squash their trade. And I speak for all of my customers and theirs as well that we have a proven track record. Uh, this whole durability issue, uh, everybody wants to know what the definition of durability is. And if you give us that, we can show you that we meet that day in and day out. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marcus? No. Um, <laughs> cut. You want to try? <laughs> Marcus Kazenka. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> hear you. Okay, that uh, is everyone on our list, but if there's anyone here who didn't sign up who would like to speak, um, I'll maybe have you line up at the podium and you could go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My name is Jacob Steen with Larkin Hoffman Attorneys, and we represent the Safe Building Materials Association of America. Our members include Louisiana Pacific, which manufactures LP, smart side, siding, and trim. Uh, as I've outlined in our correspondence, like our friends at James Hardy, we have real concerns with the definition of base, which is entirely ambiguous. Uh, as it's drafted, it could be one or six stories, depending on the context, you just have to trust us. And that is just far too ambiguous, and we would like to restrict that. At a minimum, we'd like to keep that capped at one for mid-rise buildings and two stories for high-rise buildings. But we also have much broader concerns about the arbitrary restrictions that are placed on wood-based products. The guidelines currently restrict any wood-based products on the base of a building with 21 or more units. This isn't based on science. Uh, it's not based on analysis. There's no stated relation to health, safety, or general welfare. This is purely preferential and it's subjective. With respect to the intent that is defined, uh, we've talked a lot about climate and sustainability. And uh, I think it's important to note that every one of these products meets the building code. Every one of the products meets the building code and all of the climate goals associated with the building code. But with respect to LP smart side, this is a carbon negative product. This is a product with a 50 year product life and during that product's life, LP can plant, grow, and harvest many times over the amount of fiber that is put into that piece of siding. So this is a renewable, a sustainable product, and any statements that this is less durable or less climate friendly is provably false, and we have real concerns about it. But we also have concerns about affordability, and I'll wrap up real quick. 
The city has made significant effort to make housing affordable. And by eliminating affordable products, you are making affordable housing less affordable. So we'd Thank ask you. you to reject this arbitrary language. Thank you. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? All right, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Commissioners, um, any discussion? Oh, Commissioner Campbell. So I, I will start by saying I am confused. Um, uh, because I, I, I think what, what I would like to see, there's clearly a lot of people that feel strongly about the building materials that we use in the city, which is great. I, don't, I still don't know what we're going from and what we're going to. I'm hearing that we're getting less restrictive on things like eaves and stucco and that kind of thing, but then I'm hearing testimony in front of us that it's not. And I think it would be really helpful for us as a commission before we make decisions about this, considering the feedback we're getting both in our packets and in the audience, to have a better, clearer idea of what we're moving from to two. What's the from and the two? Um, because I feel like that would help clear the air on sort of what I don't have and would help provide, I think, a needed clarity for the board to make an informed decision. I'll also say um, I, I would recommend, I, I do feel like we can help facilitate a bit of a compromise here. I feel like that does exist, and I feel like um, giving this issue more time could potentially lead us there. And so I would like to recommend that we continue this um, uh, to the next meeting as is appropriate or available to us as a body. Second. Okay, so that was a motion? And you got yep, a second? Sorry. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, Commissioner Meyer? Strongly support that motion and was going to make it myself. Um, I did want to discuss some of my reasons more and just. Um, so we can discuss a little bit, maybe at what point we bring, bring this back, because I'm not sure necessarily the next meeting is the right one. Um, so like you, I was very confused about what the status quo is and um, what this proposal moves to. You know, I, I've been on here for quite a few years and have you know, seen um, re requests to get alternative compliance fr from, from the status quo. Um, so maybe that was where some of the confusion is coming in, is maybe some of these projects were granted through alternative compliance. Like, I don't know if the Lowe's building or whichever one's um, one of the speakers brought up were, were granted in that way. Um, but it'd, it'd be really, really helpful to understand um, those things. Um, I also, um, I, I posted on Twitter about this, seeking feedback from the, the public, and really got a lot of what I felt was valuable information and a lot of things to uh, dig into further, um, especially on like on, on the embodied uh, carbon pollution in, in materials. Um, there is um, an organization that is focused on that. Uh, it's called the Builders for Climate Action. They have a whole report on that. And um, I was gonna try to have it displayed today, but I guess it would take some effort to do that, but hopefully in time for the, for the next meeting, um, we could review some of those slides because they were surprising to me. Um, so for the embodied carbon pollution, brick is the most carbon intensive of any of the materials. Um, it's 17 times more than some of the others on, on the list that were discouraging. Um, so it might be the case that brick is more sustainable in the sense of lasting longer, um, but not, but, but might be that, that may be in tension with um, the climate impact of it. Like, I don't think that brick would last 17 times longer. So I, I think those that would be something really helpful to look at. Um, there is um, an organization called the Housing Affordability Institute um, that I was informed about, uh, and they might be able to give some guidance on um, how, how these different materials impact affordability. They made the claim um, that, oh, I wrote it down, um, that for the, the average mandate for four-sided aesthetic uh, mandates with, with partial stone facades add about $20,000 per unit, and that was specific to Minnesota. 
Um, so that would be worth digging into. And some of the, the photos that, that staff shared, I, th I thought were helpful um, of, of some of the buildings that were examples of things that we're trying to avoid. I, I think what would really add on to that is if we look at some of these buildings and say, we, we don't like how these buildings look from different angles. And um, if we could try to figure out, okay, so if we changed that with different materials, how much extra would that cost? And how um, much more or less carbon pollution would that create? Um, I, I think it'd be really good to, to get into those details. And I was also going to suggest, I don't, I don't know what our rules are around this, but it'd be really nice to have a, a listening session uh, to um, have, have more in-depth discussion, to show people photos, uh, or, or to have people show photos of what they want to see or what they don't like, and, and try to you know, get into that um, more. So um, I, I think that we could, you know, with, with some uh, delay, we could produce a much better um, uh, recommendation for the council. So, um, oh, and, and the, the one last thing I wanted to mention is um, we might get preempted on this. Um, there's a bill, it's called the Legalize Affordable Housing Bill. Um, it was authored by representatives Howard, Elkins, and Hollins. Um, it was considered in the last session, uh, but due to time, it uh, didn't get a vote. But the, the chairs of the housing committees and the um, legislative leaders agreed to hear it next year. And one, one of the, it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is it uh, preempts municipalities um, from having aesthetic-based um, materials regulations. So um, if it passed as it was drafted, uh, it would not necessarily mean we couldn't have uh, regulations of this kind, but you couldn't do it for aesthetic reasons. So you could still do it for climate or durability reasons. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just putting to the, to the commission, um, we could bring this back right next uh, two weeks, or we could, I don't know, I, I don't know how much effort we want to put into it with the possibility that it might be preempted. Um, so those are my thoughts. On, I, I, I will support uh, Commissioner Campbell's original motion if that's what we want to do, but I wanted to put out there that it might make more sense to if we can continue it indefinitely until we're ready to bring it back. Um, Kimberly, did you have something? Uh, yes, uh, just procedurally, this is a legislative action. It's not a quasi-judicial action, but for the record, so all commissioners have access to the same information when they're making their decision, I would ask Commissioner Meyer to submit, I don't know how you submit a Twitter thread to uh, the clerk's office for the record, um, but I'm sure we can figure something out or if there's screenshots or links or some way that we can do that just so everyone has access to the same information that you mentioned here. Um, and then also just looking forward, we can't continue it indefinitely. We would need to choose a date. Um, you can go a certain number of cycles and I can give you the corresponding date, but upcoming meetings are July 31st, August 14th, September 5th, September 18th, and so on. Okay, thank you. Um, you walked into that one. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I'm happy to <laughs> okay. do what you need me to do on Twitter. It might be a lot of screenshots because there were a lot of comments, but um, but I'm, I'm just wondering if staff could recommend a time where we have a less busy agenda. Like like today, it's had a lot of items on it. I don't know if if you know in advance ones that would have fewer items, but I, I would um, you know try to balance it out so we um, do it when there are fewer agenda items. Unfortunately, right now, I only know what our July 31st meeting is going to look like. Um, I would say it seems like there's quite a bit of information that's being asked for here. I think it would be most helpful if we could have a list of things that we're hoping to accomplish with the continuance so the co-development team can look into very specific things. Um, one cycle probably isn't going to do it, just, yeah given all of the things that have been discussed already, um, in order to turn something around for the packet, we're producing another packet next week for the July 31st meeting. 
Commissioner Campbell. So there's three things that I heard staff present on, and I and I don't know that this is accurate, so I want to I want to catch myself here, which was um, durability, climate change resiliency, and there's a third one. Um, oh. Now, uh, well, let's just start with, with durability and climate change resiliency. What I would like to do is to put some, if possible, some analysis behind what that means for us. So that like, as we're thinking about, to Commissioner Meyer's point about brick versus glass, for instance, like what's the, what are the climate change impacts of those, those materials so that as we're thinking about allowing or disallowing them, we have data to support them to the extent possible. Um, I'd also like, I mentioned earlier, I'd like a, a better analysis on what we're what we have and what we're recommending moving to so that we can see clearly what exists now and where we're headed um, those are the, the three things I think I would ask for as we move forward okay uh, Commissioner Kosky thank you chair Olson uh, I guess I would just add to that the you know, if we were using alternative compliances before, just like an understanding, because I'm hearing that, I've heard two different things today, that we were not using certain products prior and they wouldn't have been on our chart, but now I am hearing that, lo and behold, we do have many buildings in the city of Minneapolis that we are utilizing this product, so how did we get to utilizing those products would also be helpful, thank you. Yeah, um, I didn't just want to say, I know, thank you for your work on this. I know it's not an easy task, and um, what we've seen so far has been helpful, but I will say, I, I think I agree with the other commissioners that, you know, it's hard to understand all these building materials, um, at least for me, I'm not an architect. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so thank you for your work, um, and I would just second saying, like, what materials are becoming more restrictive, if that is the case, and just getting that all on one sheet of paper, just real simple, would be really helpful. I'll just, I think everybody's said what I wanted to say here, but I, I think we are stepping towards something that is less subjective aesthetically, which I think is a good thing. I think flexibility there, um, and something that is more performative. So I think the things that we can talk about around um, getting embodied carbon numbers uh, just stated on all our materials would be a great target, uh, even if we don't set a goal. But so there's awareness, let's start with that. Um, and I think, um, you know, you're so, <laughs> this chart is interesting. There's, the reverse chart would be more telling. There's only two or three empty spots. And so it feels like a discussion around, except for vinyl, why, why do we even have this chart? So I, I think the welcomed discussion further with staff around performance versus aesthetics um, will be good. So thank you for getting there. Commissioner Campbell. If my motion has a second, can I amend it? Uh, yeah, well, if your seconder agrees to your... I think it was Commissioner Ford. So I'd like to amend the motion I made that we continue this until the latest possible date allowed by policy or October 2nd, whichever is longer. There is no 60 day deadline for this type of an application, so October 2nd would be fine. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. All right, is there any other discussion? Otherwise, the motion on the table is to continue this to October 2nd. Correct? Yep. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any discussion. I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Alper? Aye. Baxley? Aye. Campbell? Aye. Conley? Aye. Ford? Aye. Kosky? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Olson? Aye. That's eight yeas and zero nays. All right, that motion passes, and that was our final discussion item for the evening. Uh, are there any announcements from staff? I think we're all tired and hungry, so I will just note that we have a, a committee of the whole meeting with one agenda item on it coming up on Thursday, and you should have just received that agenda. Okay. 
Anything else from commissioners before we adjourn? If not, and without objection, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. Our next planning commission meeting will be Monday, July 31st, and our next committee of the whole meeting will be this Thursday, July 20th at 4.30 p.m. Thank you, everybody.